Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for being here this morning. Today's title is The Forbidden Fruit. You know, many conjectures have been offered as to what this fruit in the garden was or resembled, and, and I have spoken on it before, but since the, the real thing has to do with disobedience, it bears to, to remember what exactly went down and why it went down and the result thereof. And so many also just don't get what the fuss was all about. I've, I've heard people say this. I've, I, it's all over the internet. It's more and more garbage is coming out and all these so-called stars, Hollywood people, are now claiming that they have some sort of inside view on the truth of God and Jesus and, and so forth, such as Jim Carrey, a total godless twit, and uh, George Carlin, the same, and many, many, many more. Uh, and they, of course, get it, they endeared to people because they were comedians. They, everybody liked them, you see. And so then when you get to that stage, then you feel like you know them somehow. You somehow have a connection. But they are godless people, period. And, of course, Carlin knows better now. Uh, he basically, not basically, he literally said God don't exist. I heard him say it from stage. Uh, and so George Carlin and so uh, it was a famous comedian and so we have them and many 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 others of course but this is a, an epidemic that is only growing just like in the last days of course it would but it all started back in the garden so what's the fuss all about others want to make the actual fruit the instigator when we know that can't be true can't blaze blame on a fruit whatever sort it may have been and isn't it just like mankind to look over there for the problem instead of here for the problem? And this is what we always do. And we find this out after God uh, questioned them on it. Everybody blamed everybody else. And we always want to make sure that everything is pleasing to the eye. This is the first thing that we really go for. This is what our flesh tells us to do. And we are ever obedient to it. Uh, it's not exclusively a feminine phenomena, uh, but almost. <laughs> it is the wife's job to, to make the pretties and to, you know, to, to, to decorate and so forth, to make a house a home, uh, general decor, flowers, curtains, furniture, etc. It takes a woman much longer to get ready in front of the mirror and because of all the things that, that, uh, that go on and that society has put up on it. And... Uh, so husbands, don't presume to take upon yourself to pick anything or any part of a wife's apparel or her hairstyle or her shoes. All you may say is, that's wonderful, honey. <laughs> that looked great on you, dear. Oh, you're such a perfect color picker. <laughs> Have at it. So, uh, and we see all this with a Proverbs 31 woman that we discussed a week or two ago that she has these very qualities that the husband leaves them alone. Says, yeah, go for it, you know. Uh, while there may be discussion on some things and, and while they're not always 100% right, they do have what we men generally don't have in that capacity. Men are not totally without it, but generally it's a woman thing. So with all the above and more, it's a... It's a feminine way or the highway. Be happy with it. And husbands, of course, as is the propensity of all men, are the more rational protectors. And this is, again, not true 100%, but that's what the role is supposed to be. Remember, we have a role that we play. You play a role, I play a role in various ways. We wear different hats, if you will, but we all have a role to play. And yet there is a reality to the person that I am, to the person that you are individually, that goes beyond the various roles. And that's also where we have to know our place and know who and where we are. When God presented Eve to Adam, for instance, he did have a sense of beauty. He did have a sense of, hey, this is right on. Because he was asked to name all the animals and so forth, and he watched their gait, he looked at them, he considered their makeup and, and their shape and so on. And the Bible says none was found as a mate for him. 
obviously. They were not the same kind. And so God puts him to sleep, takes out uh, one of his rib or maybe just flesh. The word can mean both. And, uh, and he formed with his very own hands. God did. He formed man from the dust of the earth. And then he formed Eve out of Adam. So Adam was a direct creation from God. Eve was an indirect creation from God in that sense. She was not made from the dirt alone. She was made from a part of Adam and then some dirt or whatever added to it that God made. But the moment he saw her, you know, he said, uh, this, is, this, is <coughs> excuse me, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Genesis 2.23. There's a, even with nationalities this works. If you ever go overseas and you run into another American, there's a, there's a desire even, whether you do it or not, doesn't matter, but there's a desire at least uh, to bond, okay? These are all Hispanics or these are all Chinese or these are all Africans or Europeans, wherever you are. There's an American, and you feel this closeness to them only because of that. You, you may be miles apart. You may even be actual enemies if you knew one another, you see. But there's this, we're Americans, and they're not, okay? And this is what you have in the world, and this is why you have all these divisions. This is why you have North Korea and South Korea, not just because of that. There's a lot of political stuff in it, too. But Tibet trying to get away from China because they're Tibetans. They're not Chinese, the Scottish trying to get away from England because they're Scots, Scotsmen, they're not Englishmen, and so forth. You see, Catalonia wants to get away from Spain because they're not Spaniards, they're Catalonians. This is how this works. So the world will never be put together like the devil wants to put it together. It'll be a fake oneness. And that is indeed what we have. So Adam didn't say to God, hey, that's great, but could you, you know, make it a little more here, a little less there? Could you change her in this or that category? And it is crazy to even think that, but attempting to tweak God's handiwork is what mankind has done. Look at all the transgender crap that's going on. And it is just crap. That's why I freely use that word and rightly. It's complete and total nonsense, uh, and people are ate up. The word help me in the Greek means a help answering to him. The woman is the helpmeet, though a help answering to him or one who answers is what helpmeet is. A wife is one who answers the husband. And since woman was uh, formed from man, she is obligated to be a help to man. And he is obligated to be her full protection and devoted shielding of his arm. There's no, I'm a boss and you're not. There's just, this guy has this job, and the woman has that job. And we got to get this. They each have jobs, yet they work together. That's how God designed it, to be working together. I mean, it's like Paul says, if, if I wasn't an I and I'm the arm, am I going to cry about not being the I? You know, we have an engineer in the crowd. If, 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 the, if the spoke over here says to the drive shaft over here, I sure like to be you, and thus... Quits working like it's supposed to. Is the engine ever going to run? No. Everyone is a part and everyone has their duty being that part. And it's not that we play a part like an acting thing. It is the part. That's who we are as part of our lives. God himself build. The word is bana. And he built man and woman. It's an amazing thing. When you see, when this is what Bible study is so amazing. It's not just about, oh, God took a rib and he put him to sleep and he made it even and then you just leave it at that. No, when you go deeper into it, you find out, wow, she is supposed to be an answer to him. See, that changes everything. She's an answer to him. This is why a conversation can't be one-sided or a question must have an answer. And there's no need to answer unless there's a question, <laughs> you know. It's one and the other. They play like a ping pong thing. You can't play ping pong by yourself unless you have a wall to bounce off from. But that wall is pretty much dead. You're still controlling it. But when you have somebody else who's not controlling the return, then it becomes a fun game, right? It's unpredictable then. So there has to be a response. Just like buying and selling. Who's going to sell if there's no one to buy? And who's going to buy if there's no one to sell? The two absolutely go together.
I'd say God's pretty amazing. He's smarter than me. Did you guys know that? <laughs> All of a sudden, every head went. <laughs> but I'm glad they did. So it was God's idea to give Adam a help meet, but Adam identified with her straight away because, and uh, she was the same makeup and substance like himself. God considers being alone not a preferred thing. He said it is not good that the man should be alone. Genesis 2.18. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7.7-9 7, 7 through 9, that he preferred being a bachelor. And he wished everyone could be that way. But because of our bodies and because of passion, uh, it's better to marry. So you have the two. He wasn't coming against God and saying, oh no, God's wrong. You should all be, you know, that's not what he's saying. But he was just saying it as a matter of convenience as a matter of less trouble and we all I think can attest to that to be alone means to be all one in the singular God first made all kinds of animals and brought them to him what would he name him and of course he couldn't find one but when he saw Eve he instinctively knew that she was like him and we have to remember that Adam's worldview was nowhere near what ours is. Adam's worldview before the fall was of innocence. Walking and talking with God himself would have been with Jesus, who is always the likeness of the totality of God is Jesus. Paul tells us that in Galatians and elsewhere. It's amazing. Adam is Hebrew and means red earth. And Eva, or Eve, is also Hebrew and it means life. So you have earth and life. And it's interesting that the very one whom Adam chose as his helpmeet, his mate, his helper, his answer, the very one who was not just close but exactly like him, in terms of flesh and bone, is the one who led him to sin. Wow. And of course, it wasn't a malicious sin that he led. He, did, he, did a, he was led into sin out of compassion and love for Eve. He did not want to lose Eve. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 2, 13, 14, that Adam was not deceived. The woman was. A woman was deceived. She fell into sin. Adam only fell into sin when he decided to go ahead and eat that fruit that she turned and gave to him. He was right there. People forget this too. He knew it wasn't right. He knew it was wrong. But this is the thing about subtle lying. And we'll get about that in a little bit. A lie that's open and must be big and often repeated. Other lies that don't need to be open and often repeated have to be more subtle. They have to be so smooth that it's like, well, yeah, duh, of course I'll sin. And we'll all fall into that if we're not very careful. So with this decision, to eat of this fruit they've, not, they've been told not to eat from, they crossed over to the spiritual side of life. They'd experienced God walking and talking with them in the cool of the day in the garden. They experienced authority being over all the animals, the fowl, the fish in the sea and everything. God made Adam Lord of this earth and he placed him in this garden. That's where everything was supposed to spread from there with that same intent. And of course it didn't go very far. We don't know, we know Adam was formed as an adult, not a child. We don't know how far into after his forming the fall came, but we know it couldn't have been that long. Just like the flood, Noah built the, built the uh, uh, I mean the Nimrod, <coughs> excuse me, began to build the Tower of Babel uh, less than 100 years after the ark landed on, on the Ararat Mountains of today's Turkey. That's not very long. 
the children of, Moses, or of Noah right away went out and within you know, several generations there, two or three generations, there were a bunch of people on earth. That's how it goes. And if you do the math, the math will bear that out. There are some who estimate a population, world population of 10 to 12, some say as high as 15 billion people when the flood occurred. The movies and the naysayers, oh, there's a few people, a few tribes, a few ape-like people running around, you know, no, and of course they don't even believe in the flood anyway. It's nonsense. These same movies tell us that, oh, when David's armies fought, there might have been a few dozen guys here against the two. No, no, no. The Bible says that uh, 200,000 men from Judah, 200, you know, uh, 50,000 so on, so on, 75. I mean, there was a bunch of people. I'm going to believe the Bible. There was a whole bunch of people. Ah, the forbidden fruit. So we crossed over into the spiritual side of life. The side that cannot be easily recognized or controlled aside from strict obedience to God's word. And that's the point. We needed to be tested. This is where the forbidden fruit comes into play. People make jokes of it today because they don't believe any of it. Just like every baby born into the world sins, Adam and Eve were created innocent. But again, like every innocent baby, the question is, would they remain that way? This is why we as parents must be very careful not to let the cuteness override justice. Justice in the home, justice with, yes, mom, dad, not, not put up with any disobedience. And the earlier you start, the better. God says if you don't spank your children, you don't love them. Think about that. The world says exactly the opposite. Does every child need to be spanked? No. Some people get it with a look and some don't, but some do need to be spanked. And if you spank them, you do it because you love them. To be beaten with a rod, God puts it that way, will put you know, scars on him or put a hurt on him, but boy, you'll save his soul. And which one is more important? We need to be tough as parents, tough as nails, because it's going to hurt and it's going to be rough. And today... Of all things, we have the government against us, so we need to be wise. So a test was initiated to test their resolve, especially Adam's, because why he was made Lord. We sometimes forget and that it is about being confirmed in our faith, just as what is described as the holy angels. They had to be confirmed in their holiness. Satan went around. <laughs> in heaven the Bible is clear and he got as many as a third of all the angels God made and he made millions and millions and millions he needed them all to do his dirty work because he's not omniscient like God is he's not omnipresent like God is he needs to be send somebody in a specific place in time in earth on the earth God doesn't have to do that he's everywhere at once don't know how to explain it because I don't really get that but I know it's true because that's who God is. If God isn't that big, then he's not God. If God is not, or if God is explainable, he's not God. <coughs> God's test consisted of allowing Satan to put them through the paces. He'd already done it up in heaven. Being born of innocence does not on its own place, one in favor with God. Just like children, you know, they, uh, they don't get counted guilty or not guilty uh, until they reach the age of accountability. However, just because they haven't reached that age yet doesn't guarantee them anything. God knows exactly when someone's ready and when they're not. We can only guess. So being tested and passing that test is where it's at. And it's God and God alone who must be obeyed. You know, in John 6, 29, the disciples asked him, uh, 28, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? In other words, we want to do the will of God. Jesus answered them in 29 and said, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. So believing in Christ is the work of God. And it's the only work we're called to do. 
And people, of course, confuse that with our own works and trying to make it to heaven. You guys already know that. We can never work to make it to heaven because everything that we have is given to us. Nothing came on our own. But our faith, we do give. Our faith is what we willingly give. It's the only thing we actually own. If I didn't own my own faith, my giving it to God would be worthless. If I didn't stand that. It must come from me and me alone. And there are so many who teach, oh no, God gives you the faith to give. They call it saving faith to give. God gives you faith to have faith in him. Well, then he's got to give it to everybody. Because God says he wishes that no one would be lost. That all come to the knowledge of him and be saved. Well, somebody's wrong. And it isn't the Bible. It's my faith that God wants. And it's my faith that I have to give. And it's the only thing that I truly can give. I can't contribute in no other way to the salvation. And I'm glad for that. I couldn't have thought of it. I couldn't have arranged it. And I certainly couldn't have paid for it. Wow, that's awesome stuff. Ow! That's right. You know, no one publicly, especially on TV, and not many on the web actually teach this biblical concept that we have to be tested. But we do. Once you come, will you remain? Abide, 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 abide. It's everywhere. Dozens and dozens of times all over the scriptures. Abide. Don't let your faith be destroyed or shipwrecked, ruined in any way, shape, or form, because that faith cannot save you. So God is love and life, and Satan is a liar and a loser, and dead. He's spiritually dead. He's already dead. Because his end is already known. Just like all who choose not to believe, not to do the work of God that Christ said in John 6, 29. What's the work of God? To believe on him whom he sent. Who did he send? Jesus. The Savior, hallelujah. Yeshua HaMashiach. The Christ. The one anointed of God. Whom does it make more sense to obey? Satan or God. While people are outright claiming to obey Satan now, and yet, as in Satan worship, there are a bunch of it around, and there always have been, but it's getting gaining more and more popularity. And people are implanting things, and they're in their shaving their heads and implanting things that look like they have horns. I mean, all kinds of stuff. It's crazy, walking around like that. And talk about transgender, right? Anything and everything to, uh, to come against the truth. We're surrounded by it. We've got to be strong enough to realize it. And also strong enough to realize that, hey, God's calling me to talk to this person. But if you talk to somebody and they completely go off on you, then you were wrong about God. He hasn't prepared their heart. The Bible says in Proverbs that, uh, you know, to try to witness to a fool is not wise. He may turn against you. And it may be somebody you have to work with. Maybe somebody who pays your paycheck. <laughs> you see, we have to be wise in this world. We live among sinners in a screwed up, ate up, going to the lake of fire world where millions and millions, if not billions, have sold their souls, seared their consciences, and they're never going to come. And we got to be careful not to be so after souls that we chase silly people that will never come. But we are to love souls. We are to try to save souls as directed by the Holy Spirit. So we can't shun from it. And just because somebody may spit on us or want to slap us or whatever, uh, that doesn't stop us from doing it again. But I'm just saying, make sure you hear from God. Because there is that counterpoint. So we give our trust to God as a gift, our faith that's saying, have me, God, have all of me, my mind, my soul, and my body. Have me because I gave my faith to you. Where else am I going to give it? And if I keep it, what have I got? Belief in self? That's going to get old real quick. And it does. We have to believe in God and in the one whom he sent. Hallelujah. 
Grace is the rule of law since, since the cross. And the test is to believe God, who is the truth over the devil and his lies. The angels who fell with Satan, the one, the one third, they had a power of choice. There's war in heaven, Daniel 10, 13, 21, and 20 and 21. And here's what that warfare is to us. Described in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. This is all part of the fall, all part of the forbidden fruit. It wasn't about the fruit, it was about the disobedience. Who cares what the fruit was? Go with me to Ephesians. Let's go over that because it's wonderful stuff. Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, chapter 6. The very last chapter, Paul is very succinct. I've preached on this a bunch. Spiritual warfare. Start with uh, verse 10 and read with me, please. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles are his schemes, his plans. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. So ultimately, our fight is in the spirit world. Against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. High up where there's authority in heaven among angels and so forth in the spiritual world, there are plans being made for your soul and for my soul on Satan's side to destroy it completely, on God's side to keep us going, to protect us. And how do we get there? By trusting him to do just that, by gifting him our faith. 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Having girded your waist with truth, that's where you start. He now outlines a Roman soldier's garb that they had on, you know, the helmet, the breastplate and so on. And he starts with two. They had a belt around them and on that belt was hooked the breastplate and the sword of the spirit which we learn. But that's how Paul is painting this picture of a Roman soldier, which in his day everybody knew because they were, you know, controlling Israel. <coughs> so having girded your waist with, why did you start with truth? Because if you don't start with truth, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, of right standing with God, and having shod your feet with a preparation of the gospel of peace. In other words, go out and tell the true story of God. Tell somebody that Jesus died for their souls. And if they spit in your face, say, see you later, and go on to the next person. Above all, verse 16, taking the shield of faith in which you will be able, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You hold your faith shield up because you're in faith. You trust God and those errors and those rockets and those, uh, those attacks will not be able to get through. And then take the helmet of salvation, verse 17, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And then he says, pray for me, etc. We're to pray for the whole church. I name names in my prayer, but I don't always get it done. And I forget people now and again, you know, especially people who've left and people who haven't been in my life for a while. We've, we're all in that place. But when I say, Lord, bless all the saints, all those who love you, does he know who that is? Well, yeah. I don't have to give him a name or a hair color or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Praise the Lord. But if I just stay there and I just, you know, sort of superfluously say that all the time, then that gets to be a habit that can water things down. You understand? So you've got to get on your knees and then you don't have to always. But you've got to get back on your knees and you've got to answer some, some questions to yourself and you've got to ask him some questions and you've got to name some names and then you forget him. But you name it, you know, this is kind of thing. Is that not how you guys pray? It's how I pray. I mean, that's just how it is in my life. And I'm pretty sure that I'm not special. 
except, of course, to my wife. <laughs> so it wasn't the fruit itself, but the eventual disobedience to God. Our choice is the most powerful and precious thing we have. How oh, come on, let's go to a party. We won't get caught. We won't, you know, we'll get a little drunk. We won't get caught. You have a choice right then and there. Oh, you really ought to meet this guy or this girl. You know, they got this, blah, 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 blah. You got a choice to make. You ought to take this class. The professor's really good. You have a choice to make. You can go straight ahead, left or right to get to whatever destination. You could even go backwards. You have a choice to make. Oh, come on, man. Help me out, man. Come on, man. Don't you love me, man? Help me out. Come on. Or some low life. You have a choice to make. We got choices all day long. We're free in that we have choices. So we have war in heaven. The war is for your soul and mine. And God's already told us how to get ours. Get in faith. Stay there. I don't care what happens. I don't care if your head gets cut off. I don't care if they skin you alive. I don't care if they cut your kids' throats in front of you. And they've done plenty of that in the past. You stay in faith. It's a tough one. I'm not saying I'm above any of that. I'll struggle with it just like you, especially in the things I just mentioned. Why does everybody need a sweet story? I don't get it. We're living in an evil world. Their eternity is shot unless they get right with God. And everybody wants to, you know, do the fiddler on the roof thing. Are you kidding? Playing a silly game. I've said it before. You guys know I like to have fun. I got jokes. My son knows we joke all the time. My wife, we joke all the time. I'm a happy person. But when it comes to the Word of God, we better get right. And that ain't the time to make fun. Satan wants to be worshipped as God. He knows he can never be him. He doesn't even try to, co try to convince people that he is, although some will call him that. And, well, you know, God's his, or Satan is this, this person's God, or that person's God. Well, I get that. But he himself never said that. He said he wants to be like God. He never said he wanted to be God. Two different things. So it all starts with a test and the perversion of that test by Satan. It wasn't the fruit, but the eventual disobedience. And Satan too couldn't care less if they ate the fruit or what kind of fruit it was. He knew and needed only their action to disobey the Lord. That's what he needed. That's what he was after. And this disobedience would have yielded the same result no matter which tree they would have picked from. God made it easy for them even then. He gave them a particular... There were thousands of trees. They all looked good, smelled good. The fruit, the fruit was good because he made it for them, for them to have to eat for food. And yet he said, don't eat off of this particular tree. He describes it and even the location of it. I mean, it doesn't get any easier. That's the grace of God right there. <laughs> wow. You know, why didn't you say, okay, if you disobey me, in any way you'll have the knowledge of good and evil and that's not good for you. They would have still disobeyed. But he gave him a particular thing, a particular object. And isn't that what we have today in selling the secret? Selling the secret to life. Go to this guy on the mountain with a wispy, long, white beard you know, in a lotus position. Hey, listen, I've studied this. I'm a professor of psychology. I study philosophy. And what I found out, I put in a book. 
And you can get set free just like I got set free. Buy my book. Attend my $500 per person four-hour seminar. That's how you get freedom. Look at the stats. And I have beautiful pictures on slideshow. And of course I look good because I make money because I'm dressed good. And people eat that up. You see, that's what Satan did. He looked good. It's just like the little independent minds, they constantly want to know why. Clean your room, Johnny. Why? Take out the trash, Mary. Why can't Johnny do it? Are we there yet? <laughs> Why does it take so long? Why do these things always happen to me? Why wasn't I given this or that? Why can't I play like them? Why, why, why? Why me, Lord? What did I ever do? The old Chris Christopherson song. He wrote that in about 15 minutes. He was backstage at a show, a true story, at an award show, and he was supposed to you know, give out an award, and they wanted him to do a song to fill in three or four minutes. And he had nothing. He didn't, he didn't come. He was just supposed to present a thing, so he didn't come with any kind of plan to perform. But he wrote this song, Why Me? It actually became a number one hit. <laughs> I like Chris Christopher. He, he was pretty cool. He was uh, schooled by Johnny Cash, if you believe the stories out there. And, and Johnny Cash was a witness to him, actually. Don't know where he stood with the Lord, but he did witness to people. He actually had a preacher that he paid in every one of his shows that came and gave her a salvation message to the audience. In some cases, that was pretty smart that he didn't do it himself. He put himself in the background, the man in black. You know, because he did his act, he did his thing, he did his worldly thing, and then he stepped back and he let a man of God give the message. I kind of think that that was admirable. He could have done, oh, look at me, I'm Johnny Cash, I'm saved, why don't you get saved too? He could have done that. But he knew he had a life like everybody else. Divorce and this and that and trouble and selfishness and everything else. So that was a wise move. It was just a little sideline. That wasn't even in my notes. So why me, Lord? What did I ever do? You know, Eve wandered with just one. And then, of course, she didn't have her facts straight. She changed God's word, she added to it, and took away, and that's what we do. When we add to God's word, we automatically take something away, and when we take it away, we automatically act, add to it. <laughs> Deuteronomy 4.2, Deuteronomy 12.32, 1 Corinthians 4.6, and Revelation 22.18 and 19 said, do not add anything to this word or don't take it away. There's a reason why God gave us this commandment. You know, the serpent is the Hebrew word nahash, And rabbinic legend has it that the serpent walked erect. And that might very well be true because scripture tells us that God then at the curse said, you shall walk, crawl on your belly all your life, which means he must not have done it before. And so <coughs> he had the power of speech and talked freely with his victim. He was wily, insidious, and crafty. So when, when the serpent of the time of the garden came up to Eve he didn't slither and he wasn't hanging from a tree limb like we see pictures depicted today walked upright is a very very possibility in any case the creature walked until the curse Nahash means to make a hissing sound that's what the word means so in Hebrew Bible, you'd have when the serpent, whenever you have serpent, you have that, and we have that today. And the serpent is known as uh, and associated with evil all throughout the world, except for the religions of the world put him up here at the top as the creator. I've showed you the PowerPoint of the serpent worship all over the world.
another uh, thing in the Hebrew word for subtle. Now the serpent was the most subtle creature God had made. Hebrews, uh, I mean Genesis 3, 1. The word, the Hebrew word contains the idea of exceptional shrewdness. <laughs> of course. Exceptional shrewdness. He was up against somebody who had walked and talked with God. He was up against somebody that had no rival at the time. He was up against someone that should have known God enough to say, get away from me, you liar. <coughs> but he appealed to other things. He appealed to the flesh right away. And then he ridiculed God, just like George Carlin and just like all the other knuckleheads. And since you and I don't want to be ridiculed, especially in public, and the ones who are nervous about and they kind of laugh like that. The ones who don't care anymore. <laughs> and they carry it on. And only we will say, you know what, you're an idiot. You're a liar. You're going to the lake of fire. Shut your mouth. I'm out of here. I'm separating myself from you and all your pagan, no good, worthless people. Oh, where's your love? Where's your Christian love? Oh, it's in place. I just told it to you. I just told you how it is. I just loved you more than any and all of your buddies who want to get drunk with you and tell you lies and live in, in sin. And I just told you, you're going to the lake of fire lest you repent and come to faith in Christ. Because he did die for you. As worthless as you are, completely worthless, no value in you, yet he died for you. Remember the word for a being condemned to hell, uh, Apolumi, has a meaning just like this word subtle has exceptional shrewdness in its meaning. The word uh, Apolumi has that even that which is still valuable in you will be destroyed in the lake of fire. Because when God made everybody, of course they had value. But of their own volition, they lowered that standard way down to where we can say there was really no value there. But God knows. This is why God died for all. He could not just die for those who will believe. That's a lie. That's a Calvinistic lie. He died for all, even though all wouldn't come. Because he's totally just. How could he die for just part? You know, if you have two or three kids, you're just going to take care of the one or the two, or you're going to take care of all of them. You're going to feed them all, you're going to clothe them all, you're going to love them all, you're going to school them all, you're going to spank them all if you need to, you know. You do them all! Because that's what love does. The serpent was more subtle than all the rest. So what's wrong with the desire to be wise? Because that's what he promised her. You can be wise just like God. Well, nothing except it doesn't and can't come from a tree nor its fruit. Wisdom comes from God and God only. James tells us that. If you want wisdom, James chapter 1, if you want wisdom, ask God. But don't ask him wavingly or, you know, well, I don't know, God, you know, I sure like to have some. But if you don't want to give me any, it's okay. You know, no, ask him for wisdom. I want some wisdom, Lord. You promised it. Let me have some. As much as you think I can handle and I can stand. And James said, you'll get it. I believe I've gained wisdom. God didn't give me everything that it might still be for me because it comes in spurts because I'm not ready for everything. Next year I might be ready for more than I am now. I'm hoping to be. You know, are your five-year-old ready for 15-year-old stuff? Of course not. See, so you increment that thing, just like a child grows up. It's awesome stuff. Life experiences give some useful wisdom, but only as it pertains to this earthly physical life. Godly wisdom has no such limits. I love it. God is limitless. <laughs> oh, he's not God. This is why the silly people try to explain God and you know, find out scientifically if there's a God. It's, well, what a bunch of nonsense. If you could do that, then you'd be God. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
If you could explain God, you'd be God. I will be like the Most High, he said. They both walked and talked with the Lord in the cool of the day, Genesis 3, 8. God had to test them. Yeah, but God already knew the outcome. That's right. The test wasn't for him. The test was for them. You don't get tested to become a PhD or whatever for the school. I mean, you do in the world because, you know, so many PhDs. So many. But you get tested for you. So that you go out and get a job, that you go out and do the and do the, the skill. You see, you get tested for you. That's what this is all about. Any test is for you. Are you still awake? Yes. Yes. Some of you, barely. Let me are you awake? Yes. Thank you. Satan led her to believe that it was the fruit itself that was the issue. When all along it was the disobedience to God's command he was seeking. She thought that fruit will give me wisdom. Well, she just walked with God who is wisdom. <laughs> Where did that confusion come from all of a sudden? There wasn't a bunch of rock bands confusing her beforehand. You know, Benny, Kenny, and Joyce weren't around at the time to confuse them with a lie of word faith. Calvin wasn't around to confuse him with a lie of once saved, always saved, no matter what. She didn't have any of that, yet she went right for it. Wow. No wonder Jesus has to rule with a rod of iron during a thousand years. Satan's locked up, so he's on no one's shoulder. He's not commanding anybody to do anything. It's purely mankind who made it into the millennium, who will get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, until the thousand years is up. And they will attack Jerusalem one more time. Wow. The problem is. Had got inside Adam and Eve when they sinned. And it wasn't going to go out. Unless there's a new birth. That's why you and I have to be born again. We're born with the Adamic sin. Innocent. But not sin free. We got to understand transgression, the responsibility that goes along with it, and so how much good for humanity as a whole does the women's lib movement do? Well, none. Look where we've been in the last 40, 50 years since the 60s. Look where we've gone. We've gone to legalizing every kind of perversion there is. And not that that movement is the culprit. It's just one of the many things that led to it. God has declared that her desire would be for the man. And that the man is in charge of the family slash house. But then we read Proverbs 31. And who really runs the household? A virtuous woman. She's a business person. She raises her kids. She has servants. There's nothing lowly or weak or cheap or anything about that woman. That's how God sees women who know their place. That's awesome stuff. And men as well. And men have been idiots for mistreating women all these decades and centuries and uh, decades, millennia. Always blaming somebody else. Satan is the wrecker of families and homes. And you know he had no power over Eve except that which she willingly gave him. He said there's where the wisdom is to be found. She said okay. By saying okay she obeyed him not God. And he never said listen obey me. He never said that. He just said why don't you find some wisdom. Because you know God, he wants to keep it from you. He never put himself on a pedestal and said, do it because of me. Let me be the one. He never said that. But he got that anyway. Oh, we got to look at it. We got to think a little deeper here all the time.
Any husband or child old enough to understand the gift that their wife or mother is and was given, especially if they were gifted to be professionally astute uh, somehow or career oriented, would never keep her from it. Just that they work together. But motherhood comes first and foremost. And so, and God, and Satan knows this too. So what's he do? He wrecks households so much so that everybody's so busy working just to make a buck to pay the bills. And then the other stuff sort of flies by this. Even if you believe in the other stuff and you work the other stuff to the best of your ability, it has no choice but to be down here somewhere. It can never be raised up to where it's supposed to be because the time isn't there. The opportunity isn't there because you're at the factory all day. And you give your kids to strangers all week as babysitters, no matter how sweet they are. And you pay half of your salary for most women or more to that, whatever they're making on the job. I mean, that's a screwed up mentality. It's a screwed up system, but that's where we all are in this world, aren't we? Hang in there with me. I'm almost finished. So bottom line is, Eve, without knowing it, I must say this, without knowing it, without realizing she was being selfish, was selfish. She just really wanted to have wisdom. And did she not know? She could have gone to Adam and said, hey, you know, the Lord... And you were talking the other day. I was just coming up on you. And what was that all about? Well, you know, the Lord God made us. He's protected us. He's provided all this stuff. What's with this wisdom stuff this guy's trying to tell me? There's this thing that God made. He's a serpent. Came up to me and he said, da 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 That discussion never happened. Because Satan never threatened her. He enticed her. He awakened things in her that he knew were there because he had it. He was the most beautiful thing uh, in heaven, the Bible tells us. Satan was the most beautiful thing in heaven to look at. Wise, wisdom, more wise than anybody else. Go with me to Ezekiel real quick. I wasn't going to do this, but this is good. Ezekiel 28. Nah, it's Isaiah 14. No, 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 it's Ezekiel 28. <laughs> All right, Ezekiel 28, uh, starting with verse uh, 12. When you're there, say, Ow! I've read this before, but it's been a long time. We need, you probably haven't been there on your own, so I'm going to read it again. Chapter 28, the book of Ezekiel. Are you there? Yes. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God. Now here, he's speaking to the, the a real physical king, but he's not addressing a real physical king. And we find this out by what's being said. Thus says the Lord God. So he's really addressing he who is controlling the king of Tyre, this physical human you were the seal of what? Perfection. What man can say that? Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Wow. He's describing not the king of Tyre. He's describing Satan. You were in Eden. The garden of God. This also, this is, there are two Edens. There's a mineral Eden they call it, and the vegetable Eden. The vegetable Eden was where Adam and Eve was. The mineral Eden is around the throne of God. The precious fiery stones they call them. The topaz, the diamonds that, that lay before the throne of God in heaven. So that's what it's talking about. The king of Tyre was not before the throne of God in heaven. 
So you were sealed perfection, full of wisdom and perfected in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes, this is where music comes from in instruments, was prepared for you on the day you were created. This is why music is so powerful. This is how Satan gets to people through music. Because he is music. Nothing wrong with music. He's a perversion of music, I should say. He has the ability to pervert it. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. See, Satan was created. Even everything that was on him and in him and thrown was created. He didn't make, come up with anything. He's not a creator. 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers. The cherubim were the highest form of angels and he was the head of all the cherubim. And covers re uh, refers to protecting. What was he protecting? The holiness of God's throne. You see the cherubim depicted how God said on the Ark of the Covenant like this. Two, two cherubim are facing each other on the Ark that Moses had with the, the, uh, the manna is in there and stuff. They were like this and their wings were touching. And God's power would come down and sit on, in between there on the mercy seat that, that the high priest could see and, and you know, to, to bless Israel and so forth in the temple back in the day. So you were the anointed cherub who covers. I, God, established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. Means on Zion, the Zion. You walk back and forth in the midst of fiery stones and in front of the throne of God. You were perfect in your ways. You were perfect in your ways. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until, until iniquity was found in you. God didn't put it there. A free will did. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence. This trading is like international. It's commerce is the co more correct word. By the abundance of your trading and commerce, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. See, he was taking the king of Tyre and controlling him and making him rich, thus making himself rich, thus getting more and more souls to control. Everybody get that? That's what this means. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you. This is way back, and he's already destroyed. Remember I said to you he's already dead? This is why I can say that. <laughs> it's over in eternity of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, O protecting cherub. From the midst of the fiery stones, your heart was lifted up because of your what? Beauty. And he knew that Eve would have it when she looked at the fruit. It was obviously pleasant to look at. And she considered the pleasantness of the fruit. And therefore, it caused her to say yes to it. If you and I look at something ugly, something or someone, or a dish or something, we're going to stay away from it. We want it to look good. Look at all the food shows. It's all about what? Presentation. Especially when you get to the, you know, high dollar stuff, which has no food on it. And, and uh, you know, it's supposed to taste good, but it's presentation. It's got a little thing here, a little thing there. And the sauce is just, you know, just, you, you see all this stuff. And it, it's overdone to me. I just want some good meat and potatoes. Now, I don't mind a good presentation. It's pleasant. But we overdo this. But this is why. Because they know that it gets to everybody. It causes you to buy it. It causes you to sign up. You see. So you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings. Satan. That they might gaze at you. That's all those who are in the lake of fire. Or in hell already at that time. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. So many sins you can't even count them. By the iniquity of your trading. Again, this is all about uh, making money. Mammon. Therefore I brought fire from your midst. I devoured you and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. That's at the end of the thousand years. Satan is thrown. He's done. 
But that thousand years is still ahead of us in time. But we'll be out of here. Hallelujah. That's who Satan is right there. Not this you know, blood dripping from fangs, nonsense and posters. Satan is looking good. Satan is wisdom. Well, he's not wisdom, but he's full of wisdom. Jesus is wisdom. I meant to correct that. Let everybody not misunderstand me there. But if Satan didn't have some wisdom, he'd be an idiot. And he's no idiot. This is why you can't engage. Eve should have said, I'm out of here. Or get away from me. Get out of the garden. Adam, get over here. Tell him to get out of here. But she engaged with him. This is why a, a slick lawyer can get you to say things he wants you to say, understand, if you engage in that. And then most people do because they're afraid the judges, you have to answer. You know, it's like if somebody, yes or no? I don't want an explanation. Just answer yes or no. I made up my mind a long time ago. That's never going to be the case if I'm on the, on the seat. I'm going to tell you my mind. I'm not going to tell you yes or no. Because yes or no can be a leading question. Have you quit beating your wife yet? Yes or no? Don't give me. A... If you say no, that means you're still doing it. If you say yes, it means you did do it. See, it's a leading question. Yes or no doesn't cover it. If you're innocent, you understand what I'm saying? But if you ask that question and force yes or no, you're making yourself guilty no matter which one you answer. This is what politicians do day in, day out. This is why I say none of that's biblical. And this is why you're voting. My voting is worthless. In the end, it is. You can vote if you want. Go for it. But the point is, you're not really getting anybody else. Because you've already been given candidate A or B. It's already done for you. And not to make you feel like you got a part in it. Oh, look, you can choose. It's ridiculous. That's not democracy anyway. But let me not digress any further. So the wrecker of families is Satan. This guy I just described, this being, way more smarter and powerful than you and I, but he can never, ever take what you don't want to give him. Never. He doesn't have that power. He gets it through the several back doors, you know, and sneaks in and looks a certain way and all this kind of stuff, gets you to think a certain thing. And then if you follow that long enough, bang, he's got it. And you don't even know it's him. Wow. So in Eve's case, it was selfishness that was at the root. For she looked at it, she tasted it, she, you know, she thought it was wonderful. That's why she gave it to Adam. If she'd have bit into it and said, pff, 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 do you really think she'd have turned and gave to her husband? No. She only gave, whoa, this is good. He already knew he shouldn't have, but he sacrificed himself for his wife. Again, this is why he's called the first Adam and Jesus is called the last Adam because he sacrifices himself for his wife, his bride, the church. Hallelujah. So the problem is with us on this earth. Always has been. The disobedience to God and His Word. Thankfully, we who believe have been given the Holy Spirit to teach us what's wrong from right through the Scriptures. It's always going to be this. When I misspeak up here, if I'm wrong about something, I want to be challenged. I, you know, I want you guys a, a Q and A and all of that because I want to be challenged. I do. If I didn't want to be challenged, I wouldn't say so. So let's obey God, but let's do it according to John six twenty nine. Believe on him whom he sent. That's the work of God. You can't do anything physical, come up with anything, design anything, invent anything, or anything else. God already did it all. We just believe him. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Thank you, Father in heaven, that you've already done it all. The concept, the blueprint, is entirely from you. All that it takes to save a fallen mankind through the testing and the redemption of all of us who fall into that failure of our first parents, Adam and Eve. 
We thank you that you had it covered already. Before the foundation of the world, you knew every one of us. What a glorious God you are. Do what you have planned for all those who hate you. Let them all be condemned as they deserve, just like Paul says in 2 Corinthians. I'm in agreement with that. I'm in agreement with King David, who also prayed these things. Let us not fall for this modern lovey-dovey garbage, but understand that justice will always be tempered with love and mercy, and love cannot operate without justice, and that you represent all of that. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your many gifts and the awesome treasures that are laid up in heaven for many of us. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Allow us to witness to as many as you put before us. Prepare their hearts before we ever even speak to them. Let us be a discerner of spirits so we don't waste our time and cast our pearls of that precious gift of salvation that only belongs to those who truly believe. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all you do and are continued to do until you call us home. In your name we pray. Amen.